wherever you are watching or listening around the world, I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to this six-part series entitled End Time, Love and Loyalty. I want to also welcome our, our audience here today and it's wonderful to see your happy and smiling faces. And this is part four in this six-part series and in this particular message, we're going to take a look at the all-important subject of what happens after death. We're going to look at the truth about death. Now they say there are two certainties in life. One of them is taxes, the other one is death. Uh, the truth is you can avoid paying tax and many go to great lengths in order to avoid the tax man, but you cannot avoid death. There is no way to avoid death. And so we need to, we need to know what happens to a person after they breathe their last, because there are different views and different theories and different belief systems in this all-important subject. When it comes to death, I think of this story that is a, a very uh, funny story about a little boy, not sure if it's a true story or not, but it certainly makes the point. A little boy that was traveling um, home after being at school, and as he's traveling home, he's walking through the cemetery. And as he's walking through the cemetery, he comes across a tombstone. And on the tombstone is this epitaph. And I want to read it for you. And it says, As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon will be. So prepare yourself to follow me. And so this little boy, as he reads these words, he scratches his head and, and he thinks about the words and then he takes a crayon out of his pocket and he writes the following words in response. To follow you, I'm not content until I know just where you went. So what happens when a person breathes their last? Where do they go? That's a very important question. And that's the question that we seek by God's grace to answer in this very presentation. There are many that believe that if you're a good person, you go to heaven. And if you haven't been a good person, well, you go to the opposite place. You go to a place called hell. Then there are those that believe that if you aren't quite good enough for heaven or when you aren't quite bad enough for hell, you go to a purifying place called purgatory, where you are prepared and purified in order that you may be fit to be part of a happy and a holy heaven with everyone else who is there. Then there are those that believe in reincarnation. Uh, millions and millions uh, of individuals, um, in particular in India that has over a billion people, uh, believe that when you die, you're, you, you, you become another person or you are transformed into another animal. And so your soul lives on in another entity. Then there are those that believe that you can speak, we can speak to our dead loved ones through spirit mediums and, and other means that we can communicate to our dead loved ones. Our dead loved ones can share with us messages from heaven. And there are many that believe in this and have supposedly communicated with their dead loved ones. So what happens to a person when they die? When people pick up their newspapers in Australia, they will at times come across a front page headline such as the one you have there on the screen. And this was from April 4, 2005. It was um, in the wake of Pope John Paul II and him passing away. And this was the front page headline. He changed the world. Death of the Pope a champion of human freedom called home to God. And so when, when Australians read this on their front pages of their, of their daily newspapers, they once again have the reinforced idea, the reinforced belief that when you die, you go to heaven. Here is another front page headline from the Sun Herald, April 3, 2005, same event. Christ is opening the door to the Pope. He is already seeing and touching the Lord. And so uh, these newspaper headlines once again reinforce within the thinking, within the psyche of Australians and people around the world that when you die, 
your soul is immediately transported to heaven. And most people are transported to heaven. I haven't been to a funeral where the priest or the pastor sent someone to hell. Have you? Everyone seems to go to heaven. I'm not quite sure if I want to be in heaven with everyone and anyone who will be there. We often hear people say when someone has passed away, they have gone to a better what? A better place. They've gone to a better place. So this is the view out there today in society. Stephen Hawking, uh, who passed away um, in uh, 2018, this is what he had to say happens immediately after you breathe your last. Notice these words from Stephen Hawking, um, the world-renowned um, mathematics uh, expert and um, one of the brightest minds since Einstein in, in many people's views. This is what he had to say. I believe the simplest explanation is there is no God. No one created the universe and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization that there probably is no heaven and no afterlife either. So this is what Stephen Hawking has to say. And there are millions and millions that subscribe to his point of view, to his belief system. And now I certainly don't. So the question is, does it really matter what you believe? Is it really all that important what you believe regarding what happens to you after you die? I mean, you're not here any longer. Who cares? What's the big deal? Well, the truth is, the truth is that it does matter. What you do believe about death and what happens when a person dies has a profound impact on what happens to you in the end times. It is an absolutely important subject. And we'll discover that as we go along. For the enemy, Satan himself, will seek to deceive the entire world, as we will discover, based on a false understanding and belief system when it comes to what happens after death and what the Bible has to say regarding that, uh, that all-important question. So we need to know the truth. So the question is, what happens after a person breathes their last? That is our question in this presentation. I pray that by God's grace and through His strength and through His Word, we will come to a very clear answer. So let's pray and ask God to bless our time in His Word. Father in heaven, we ask and pray that you will bless our time in your Word. We pray that as we open your Word right now and, and seek an answer for this all-important question that affects each and every person, we pray that your Holy Spirit will give us understanding. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, for the answer, we want to go back to the beginning of time. We want to go to the book of Genesis where God here gives us the answer by enabling us to understand how he created human beings from the very outset. Notice these words that we read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So notice here we have at the very beginning of time, God takes the dust and he breathes his life-giving breath into Adam and Adam becomes a living being. Or if you have the King James Version, it simply says a living soul living being, living soul, living person. So the two elements of dust plus breath equals a living human being. Is that nice and easy? Uh -huh. Absolutely. So the question is, what happens at death? Notice in Psalm chapter 1, 104, verse 29, Psalm 104, verse 29, we read these words. You hide your face. They are troubled. You take away their breath. They die and return to their what? To their dust. So the opposite happens at death. The, the person, the physical being, they go back into the dust. They go back into the soil. And that is why we often say at funerals, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That's where the saying comes from. So the, the physical part of the person goes back into the dust from where it came 
and the breath that God gave to that person right at the very beginning of their lives when they uttered that very first breath as they came out of their mother's womb, the Bible says that goes back to the life giver himself who gives breath to all his creatures and that is God himself. Nice and easy, nice and simple. It's the reverse of what happened at creation. Well, there are some that say, but Danny, I'm sure I have read one or more scriptures where the Bible says the spirit goes back to God at death. And that is true. Let me share that scripture with you. We can read of that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, as we have just read. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. So here the word spirit is used. And when people read the word spirit, they automatically think of soul. They automatically think of this, this immortal soul that we have. That is what people believe that goes to God, that goes to heaven. And that is how you continue to live through the immortal soul that you have. I looked up that word spirit in the original and noticed the word and what it means. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. And that word simply means breath or wind. That's what the word means, breath or wind. So let's put that word breath in the place of spirit. And now let's read the text. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the breath will return to God who gave it. Is that in harmony what we just read from Psalm 104 verse 29? Yes, indeed it is. it is. It's the exact opposite to what happened at creation. Well, it's not just the Old Testament that makes this plain, but it's also the New Testament. Notice as we go to the words of Jesus hanging on the cross. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, we read, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There is that word again. Having said this, he breathed his last. Once again, that word spirit is used. So once again, I looked up that word in the Greek. Uh, the New Testament is written in Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And I looked up that word in the Greek to discover what that word indeed was. And here is that word. The word in the Greek is pneuma. And that word means breath, air, or breeze. So once again, we have the very same message that we have in the Old Testament, where Jesus cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my breath, my life. God is the life giver. And having said that, he breathed his last. Pneuma. It's the word that in English we get pneumatic, pneumatic tools. What are pneumatic tools powered by? by air, by an air compressor. Uh, we, we know of pneumonia. And pneumonia is a, is a disease that what affects what part, of the, what part of the body? The lungs, the breathing apparatus. And so the Bible is in harmony, both the Old and the New Testament, where God says at death, the, the body returns to the dust, but that life-giving breath that belongs to God, that He gives to us as a gift that goes back to God who gave it. So that is what the Bible teaches when it comes to what happens to a person when they die. Notice the Bible uses the word soul some 1,600 times and never once does it use it so, and never once does it use the words immortal soul. That's in the King James Version. 1,600 times the word soul is used. And not once, not once in the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation are the words immortal soul. You won't find them. Notice what the Bible says regarding who alone is immortal. This is extremely important and extremely critical. Notice what we read. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul writes, He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, notice these next words, who alone is immortal, dwelling in unapproachable light. So as far as Scripture is concerned, God alone is immortal. 
You and I do not have immortality as part of who we are in the here and now. God alone is immortal. We are mortal. We are very mortal. So the question is, how did the teaching of the immortal soul come into the Christian church? If it's not in the Bible, which it isn't, how on earth did it come into the Christian church? It came into the Christian church through pagan Greek philosophy that taught that the soul is immortal. Notice what the philosopher, the famous world-renowned philosopher Plato had to say on this very subject. The soul of man is immortal and imperishable. So this teaching, this belief system that the soul is immortal came into the Christian church through pagan Greek philosophy. Just like, as we have discovered in a previous presentation, the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday came into the Christian church through paganism. The pagans worshipped the sun god, that was their preeminent God that they worshipped. And so when the pagans came en masse into the Christian church, especially during the time of Constantine, they brought in their pagan sun worship practices and their day of worship. And in the same way, when the pagans came into the Christian church en masse during Constantine's time and afterward, they brought in this teaching that was very much part and parcel of their faith and practice that the soul lives on forever and ever and ever. And guess what? Ever since that time, all the major world religions, all the major world cultures have adopted and accepted this false teaching that we have an immortal soul. In fact, we have a magazine here in Australia and it's still published today. Um, it's an insert in the Sunday Telegraph. It comes out every week. And this is uh, the August 8, 2010 edition. And notice the title, Body and what? Soul, Body and Soul. <laughs> this comes to us from pagan Greek philosophy where they believed in dualism. And what's dualism? Dualism is simply that, that, that we are made up of two separate entities. Every human being is made up of the physical being which you see, which is mortal and which perishes and which goes into the dirt and goes into the ground and becomes dust and becomes nothing at the end of the day. And you also have your soul. And the soul is that which is immortal, that cannot die, body and soul. And so this is being passed on to this very day in, in, in our popular newspapers. And that is why people have this belief and understanding regarding the body and the soul, that they are two separate entities that the Bible does not teach. So from where did the Greeks get their belief that when you die, your soul lives on forever, that your soul is immortal and imperishable. Where did they get it from? Where did all the other cultures and religious faiths before the Greeks get it from? The truth is, my dear friends, the truth is that that teaching came for the very first time from the Garden of Eden. From the Garden of Eden. Notice these words, from the serpent, the serpent, Satan himself. Then the serpent said to the woman, to Eve, you will, what's that word? Not surely die. God had made it clear to Eve and to Adam that the day that they eat of, that tr of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they will surely die because their only hope of eternal life was to put their faith and trust in God. Their only Hope of living forever and ever was to be faithful and true to the word of God, to their creator. And the serpent comes along and he says, no, you can't believe God. You can't trust in the word of God. If you eat the fruit from this tree, you will become just like God. Just like God. That is what the serpent said to the woman. And who alone is immortal according to scripture? God. God alone is immortal. So the serpent 
was tempting Eve to believe the very first lie, which was, you can be just like God. You can be immortal. And that belief system, that lie has been passed down from generation to generation to generation for the last 6,000 years all the way through to our day. So that's where it came from. It came from the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So what does the Bible say regarding when and how we get immortality? Notice these words from the Apostle Paul. He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52 to 54. And, 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 and interestingly enough, he's writing to the believers in Corinth, uh, a major city there, um, influenced by Greek philosophy uh, and Greek religion. And he writes these words, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, he's speaking of, of our bodies and, and the way we are in the here and now, must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on what? Immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So when do you and I receive immortality? We receive immortality at the second coming of Jesus. It's a gift that God gives to us at the second coming of Jesus. So until then, we are very much what? Mortal. We don't have an immortal soul. It's, immortality is given to us as a gift when Jesus comes. And by faith, through the endless ages of eternity, by partaking of the tree of life once a month, according to Revelation, we will continue by faith to enjoy that gift of immortality that comes to us from God alone. The Apostle Paul also looked forward to meeting Jesus and he looked forward to meeting Jesus at the second coming. Notice these words. From 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8, he writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, speaking of the second coming, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his what? appearing. So as far as the Apostle Paul was concerned, he was looking for the blessed second coming. He believed that he would meet Jesus. He would be with Jesus when Jesus returned. He did not believe, as many today sadly believe, that when he would die, the, ve the very next moment he would be with Jesus. No, he didn't believe that. The Apostle Paul was very clear in what he believed. He believed, according to Scripture, that when Jesus would come, that is when he would meet his Savior and not one moment before. So the Apostle Paul knew what the Bible taught on this very important subject. So the question we need to ask now is, if the dead are not in heaven, they're not in hell, they're not in purgatory, where are those who have passed away right now? Where are they? Well, the, the answer to that is found in Scripture, but I want to go to one story, one powerful, well-known story by many Christians, uh, the story of Mary, Martha and Lazarus. Uh, they, were, they were close friends of Jesus, very close friends of Jesus. And on one occasion, Mary and Martha sent messengers to Jesus sharing the news, and you can read about this in John chapter 11, sharing the news that their brother was very sick and if Jesus could immediately come, in order to heal their beloved brother Lazarus. And so we have the story here as it's recorded by John. In John chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus says to his disciples after tarrying for a couple of days in the place where he was, he says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And notice the response of the disciples. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. We all know that if someone is not well and they're getting some good sleep, that's a good sign. Isn't that right? That's an absolutely very good sign. But Jesus knew that they misunderstood what he meant by Lazarus sleeps. So then he goes and he shares with them what he means by Lazarus sleeping. Notice what Jesus says. 
Then Jesus said to them, plainly, Lazarus is what? Dead. As far as Jesus was concerned, death was nothing more and nothing less but a sleep, a peaceful sleep. In fact, when Jesus spoke with Martha regarding when she would see her brother again, notice the conversation. Jesus said to her, he's speaking to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the what? In the resurrection, when? At the last day. So as far as Martha was concerned, she was very clear when she would see her brother again. She would see him on resurrection morning. She would not, she would not see him when she passed away and be joined together with him as he was already in heaven. No, 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 no. As far as Martha was concerned, she knew that she would see her brother again on resurrection morning. The Bible is abundantly clear. Jesus was clear. His disciples were clear. Those who were closest to him were very clear. And what does the Bible go on and say? The Bible goes on and says that when Jesus came to the tomb, he asked for the tomb to be rolled away. And he cried out with a mighty voice to, to Lazarus, who had been asleep. He had been dead for four days, for four days. Fascinating little point that I discovered not so long ago that the Jews believed falsely, but they still believed that the person's spirit returns to the dead body for three days. And after three days, the dead spirit, sorry, the, the, the person's spirit returns no more. And so Jesus waited until the fourth day to come and to raise Lazarus to make it beyond a shadow of a doubt that it wasn't some returning spirit of the person that brought Lazarus back to life. But anyway, that's just a little something. And so Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come forth. Not Lazarus, come down, but Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, as the Bible describes, he came forth and he was reunited with his sisters and with all of his loved ones. The truth is, Revelation chapter 1 tells us that Jesus has the keys to the grave and to death. And at the second coming, Jesus will open all the graves of all of those that have put their faith and trust in him. And they will be reunited with Christ. They will be reunited with their loved ones and that will be part of that blessed resurrection morning. The Bible describes death as a sleep. And when you take a look at someone who has passed away, they indeed look like they are what? They're asleep. They're in a deep, deep sleep, an unconscious sleep, waiting for the trumpet to sound, waiting for that blessed resurrection and reunion morning. In fact, the Bible teaches that death is like a sleep that lasts until Christ's second coming. The Bible writers declare death asleep more than 50 times. Just a deep sleep. Notice what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know how much? Nothing, nothing. The dead know nothing. They're asleep. They're in an unconscious state unaware of any of their surroundings. Notice we also read in Psalm 115, verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into what? Into silence. The Bible is abundantly clear. The dead know nothing. The dead experience silence and silence alone. I guess I don't, quite know what it's quite like to be dead. I haven't been in that state, but probably the closest uh, that I can imagine what it would probably be like is being put under anesthetic. Has anyone here been put under an anesthetic? Okay, a number of you have. I have some 10, 10 or 11 years ago uh, when I was operated on my shoulder with, uh, with uh, melanoma. 
And I remember being under and I remember it was such a deep sleep, such as I have never experienced before, such a deep sleep. And I remember when I started to awake, I was like, where am I? I was totally disorientated, totally confused. I had no idea where I was. Anyone experienced that when you were waking up? Yeah, it's, it's a really weird feeling. And I guess that's probably the closest uh, to what it must be like uh, to be asleep as far as uh, to, to be there in the grave, to, to have passed away, unconscious of your surroundings in a deep, deep, peaceful sleep. Well, there are those that say, but, but Danny, what about, what about the thief on the cross? I mean, didn't Jesus tell him that he was going to be with him in paradise that very day? Well, let's take a look at the text. It's found there in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me where? In paradise. And they're like, there, <laughs> there you go. It says it as clear as the nose on your face. Today you will be with me in paradise. That's how I read it. That's how most people read it. Danny, what do you say? Well, the truth is, my friend, when the New Testament writers wrote the scriptures. In fact, when the Old Testament writers wrote the scriptures, they didn't use punctuation the way we use punctuation. There were no commas. Uh, there were no apostrophes. Uh, there were no talking marks and so on and so forth. At a later time, those that copied the scriptures from the Greek into the English and into various other languages, they added punctuation in order to make it more readable. And so without punctuation, it's up, to the, it's up to the translator to place the comma, in this case, wherever they believe it ought to go. Now, the comma makes a huge difference, a huge difference. Now, notice if we place the comma before, or I should say after the word today, notice how it reads. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. The difference is phenomenal. In one reading of the text, Jesus is saying to him, today, today you will be with me in paradise. In the other reading, Jesus is saying, I am giving you the assurance today. Today, while I, while I am prostrate here on this, sorry, while, while I am while I'm crucified and, and while it seems that uh, there is no hope for me or for anyone else today, you have put your faith and trust in me. Today you have called me Lord. You have called me Lord. And today as your Lord, I am giving you the assurance today that when I come, you will be with me in paradise. You have the guarantee. You have the assurance today. The thief never went to heaven that day. Jesus never went to heaven that day. In fact, when Jesus met up with Mary on resurrection morning, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us, oh, before that, before that, uh, I almost skipped out the importance, of, the importance of, of grammar. Let me illustrate that. A woman without her man is nothing. How many of you ladies believe that to be true? A woman without her man is nothing. Okay, no hands have gone up. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, let's put in some punctuation and let's see if that makes a bit of a difference. Here we go. A woman without her man is nothing. Now, how many of you women believe in that statement? A woman without her man is nothing. <laughs> of course they say. Does punctuation make a difference? Yes, indeed. Punctuation makes all the difference in the world. I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't miss out that, that very interesting, but very, very important illustration that I think makes the point very clear. Now back to the story. Back to the story. Did Jesus go to paradise that day? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Notice what we read. Jesus said to her, he's speaking to Mary. On resurrection morning, Jesus meets with Mary. Mary did not know that it was Jesus to begin with. She thought that it was the gardener. And then when she realized that it was Jesus, Jesus had to say to her, Do not cling to me, 
for I have what? Not yet ascended to my Father. That was on resurrection morning. Jesus had not yet ascended to his Father. So did Jesus go to paradise on that Friday afternoon to be joined with the thief that was on the cross there by his side? The answer is no. According to the words of Jesus, he hadn't gone to paradise yet. That is what he clearly shared with Mary. So, what did God say about communicating with the supposed dead? Now, this is a very important part of this message, a very important, a very critical part of this message. This subject has permeated every part of our culture. The, the deceptions regarding this all-important truth of God have permeated throughout every aspect of our way of life, of our culture. So what did God say to the children of Israel? What does God say to you and I today regarding seeking to communicate with our dead loved ones, seeking to get involved with the supernatural? Very important. I pray that you'll be listening up right now. Those who are here and those who are watching or listening, wherever you may be, I really pray that you will tune in to what we're about to discover from God's Word, for this is extremely important. This has the potential to indeed make an eternal difference in your life. So let's take a look at what Scripture has to say. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 to 12, this is what we read. This is God speaking to the children of Israel and He says, There shall not be among you anyone who calls up the what? Who calls up the dead. These things are a what to the Lord? An abomination to the Lord. Wow. Uh, the strongest possible language that God can use for something that is not in harmony with His word, something that is not in harmony with His will, something that is completely contrary to His character, something that has the potential to, de to deceive you and I from following the one who is the way, the truth and the life, and that is Jesus Christ. The Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament refers to it as an abomination. An abomination. You don't want to be called an abomination and you ought not to go calling people an abomination either. That's a very strong term. Now, now why does God feel so strongly about those who will seek to communicate with the supposed dead. And we know that you cannot communicate with the supposed dead because the dead are what? They're asleep. They're dead. They know how much? They know nothing. They go down into what? Into silence. Why is this so dangerous? Well, let's keep reading and discovering what God says is to be the punishment of those who are to communicate in such a way. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27, we read, a man or a woman who is a medium or one who has a familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Wow. An individual who was, who was involved in and practicing this form of, of, of mediumship, which is seeking to communicate with the dead, on behalf of the living, the Bible says, God said, they were to be put to death. Why such heavy punishment? Why such drastic measures? Well, notice what the Bible says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of what? Into an angel of light. Those who claim to communicate with the dead are not communicating with their dead loved ones. They are communicating with Satan's demons, with Satan's evil demons. There is much of this that takes place, much of this that takes place. I can tell you of one story, and I'll be very brief. A pastor friend of mine, his name's Pastor David Bertelson, so those of you who, who may know him, you can, you can verify this story. He shared with me the story um, of a woman who was attending meetings such as this and she made a decision to be baptized. She made a decision to follow Christ. She made a decision to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And on the day of her baptism, this happened in Auckland. She's walking up the steps 
of the particular Seventh-day Adventist church. I can't remember the name of the Seventh-day Adventist church, but she's walking up the steps. And as she's walking up the steps, this is a true story. She is, she, she, she is met there by her grandmother who has passed away many years before. And, and her grandmother says to her, my dear child, do not do what you're about to do. I have come from God with a message to, to encourage you to stop from being baptized, stop from joining this church, from, stop from uh, being part of this denomination. I have come from a message from God. This woman remembered what she had heard about the truth on this all important subject. And, 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 and in a moment, she cried out, get behind me, Satan. And in that very moment, this evil spirit just vanished before her. My friends, this is as real as real can be. The enemy wants to deceive us through this false understanding that we can communicate with our dead loved ones. Notice spiritualism is founded on two key principles. Number one, conscious life exists after death. That is the immortality of the soul, which we have looked at, which, which is ingrained, which has permeated every aspect of our world culture in all the world religions, in all the world philosophies. By and large, this is what is taught and believed. Secondly, that the dead can communicate with the living. As I pointed out, all the world's major religions, uh, they, they teach on this very point that you can communicate with the dead loved ones that the soul lives on after death in another form in another state in another place this is this is right across the board and i am not surprised because the enemy is seeking to set up the entire world in order to be deceived at the very end of time through this very means the apostle paul warned us of what we were to expect, especially in the last days. Notice these words from the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in what times? The latter times or, or the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of what? Of demons. This teaching of the immortality of the soul, that when you die, your soul lives on. That is a teaching from the enemy. It's a doctrine. A doctrine is a teaching. It's a teaching from the devil himself. What does the Apostle Paul say? Notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 5, 11. Have how much fellowship? No fellowship with the unfruitful works of what? Darkness, but rather do what? Expose them. So that is the reason why in this all-important series, end time, living, uh, love and loyalty, uh, we're looking to expose the truth regarding what happens to a person when they die. Because this is exposing the works of darkness. This is exposing the works of the enemy. And Jesus said, and I love what he shares. He says, in John 8, 31 and 32, if you abide in my word, you will do what? You are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth and the truth will do what? It will set you free. If you and I abide in the word, if we take time each and every day to open the word and find out what God's word has to say on this and every other important topic when it comes to our eternal salvation, we'll know the truth and we will not be deceived. The only way you and I will ever be deceived is if we take our eyes off God's Word. God's Word must be the foundation for our faith and practice in all things. And the only sure foundation is the Word of God. If they speak not according to this Word, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, it is because there is no light in them. Instead of light, there is what? There is darkness. There is darkness. The book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, contains God's truth for the last days and exposes Satan's deceptions more so than any other book of the Bible. It's a book that the enemy did not want to be written. 
And here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, the second angel's message of these three all important final messages of God's love that need to go to all the world, we have these words. Revelation 14, verse 8, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, what is Babylon? We've looked at that in a previous, in a previous series when we looked at um, end time apocalypse. So you can look at that on another day and you can maybe order those, uh, order those messages from, from 3ABN. But Babylon, Babylon is deception. Babylon is confusion. Uh, Babylon is rebellion against God and His Word. That's what Babylon is. Babylon seeks to deceive and, and the enemy uses uh, this system called Babylon in order to deceive the whole world. And notice what we read in Revelation chapter 18 regarding this deceptive power that the enemy uses. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And has become a what? A dwelling place of what? Of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. We don't have time to unpack um, everything in this particular verse here, but simply to say that at the end of time, the enemy is going to pull out all the stops. And at the end of time, the enemy is going to seek to deceive the entire world in many different ways, but especially through spiritualism, especially through this very important teaching that we are taking a look at. In fact, in Revelation chapter 18, and verse 23, notice what the Bible says. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you. And God here is speaking of Babylon. That's the context anymore. For by your what? Sorcery. How many of the nations? All the nations were what? Deceived by your sorcery. I looked up that word sorcery. And notice what the word is in the Greek. It's the word pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmacy from in the English. It also mean, it means medication, magic, sorcery, and witchcraft. Wow, this is, this is at the very heart of Babylon's final attack at the end of the world. And the Bible is clear that the entire world, all the nations will be deceived. Now, how much has magic and witchcraft and sorcery permeated our worldwide culture. Let me take you to Hollywood. Not the Hollywood that you may be thinking of, but the wood called holly from the holly tree. Notice Harry Potter, made famous by J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter series, has a wand made out of Hollywood. Interesting. Holly is associated, notice this wood called holly. It's associated with the cycle of death and rebirth and is good for spells that involve sleep or rest. Fascinating. I looked that up. You can go home and you can look that all up. It's there. And I'm asking the question, and I pray that you will be asking the question too. Are we letting Hollywood put us under a spell by putting us to sleep spiritually? Is that possibly taking place? And I think the answer is overwhelmingly what? Yes, Hollywood. Hollywood, the enemy's final attempt to deceive the entire world has to be, by and large, through Hollywood. It has to be, based on the evidence. I mean, just take a look at what is on our television screens. Take a look at what's in the movies. Take a look at what's in books, in popular books. It all started off nice and easy, uh, nice and innocent with I Dream and Genie and, and Bewitched and, um, and Walt Disney. And it's fascinating, Walt Disney. Ha have you seen how Walt Disney begins or ends? With the wand. Isn't that right? Ding! <laughs> Maybe not quite like that, but <laughs> it's the wand. The enemy is seeking to put you and I to sleep. And in more recent times, we've got, we've got movies like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Star Wars, that, that epic series that, 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 that has captivated millions upon millions upon millions around the world. Uh, Lord of the Rings and, and this new series in the last 10 years, this Marvel series um, where some 21 movies and counting uh, have been produced in the line of the supernatural. 
The enemy is doing his utmost in order to deceive the world. He's pulling out all the stops. And if you can't see it, then you need to go and get some serious help from a spiritual doctor. Not a physical doctor, but a spiritual doctor. You and I need to go into the Word. We need to go into the Word if we don't see what's going on. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. These are the words from the Apostle Paul where he writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the what kind of forces? Against the spiritual forces of what? Of evil in the heavenly places. It's a cosmic battle going on. A heavy cosmic battle that is going on. My friends, I could spend a lot more time, but we don't have time. But I want to encourage you. If, if you have been involved in, in, in watching or reading anything regarding the supernatural, it may be fun, it may be enjoyable, it may be entertainment. But my friends, my friends, it's deadly entertainment. It's absolutely deadly for your spiritual health and well-being. It will lead you to the place ultimately where it led Eve, who was tempted and lured in, by the voice of that serpent that said it would be harmless. It would be harmless. And in fact, it would be good for her to partake of that fruit of the forbidden tree. I want to encourage you, have nothing to do with the fruits of darkness. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Harry Potter books need to go in the bin. Those movies, do not watch them. A Ouija boards, anything and everything to do with the supernatural, turn your back. Avoid like the plague. Don't have anything to do with it. I encourage you, I plead with you for your salvation. Well, let's talk about the Apostle Paul. What is the blessed hope for the follower of Jesus? Notice what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will do what? They'll rise first. Then he goes on. Then we, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And he finishes off by saying, therefore do what? Comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. What an awesome day that will be. What an awesome day that will be when Jesus will come. And, 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 and there will be the great resurrection and reunion morning when the, the dead in Christ, the dead in Christ, those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus, they will be brought together and reunited and they will be lifted up from this earth to join those who are alive. And together, the Bible says, they will meet the Lord in the air. What a wonderful day that will be. That is the blessed hope of the Christian. That is the blessed hope of the follower of Jesus. The day when there will be no more wrinkles, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more death, no more separation. Are you looking forward to that day? I am so looking forward to that day. I want to end by sharing with you a powerful testimony, a powerful testimony of, of this lady here in the center. Her name is Jane, and I had the privilege of baptizing her um, two or three years ago. And uh, this is Jane coming up out of the water at her baptism. You can see, the, you can see the, the smile. You can see the joy on her face. Jane was led um, to, to the Lord and to... Uh, to a decision to follow Jesus uh, through her good friend there on the left, Liz. And I had the privilege of spending some time with my friend uh, Jane and, and baptizing her. On the day of her baptism, uh, Jane shared her testimony. She shared how the Lord had transformed her life, how he had, how he had completely transformed her life from where she was walking in darkness to now walking in the ways of Christ, walking in his wonderful light. She was 50 at the time. And for the majority of her life, she 
had walked far away from Jesus. Uh, she wasn't interested in Jesus, but she had a praying mother. Praise God for praying mothers. Amen. She had a praying mother who would meet together with her friend every single day for 35 years and pray for her daughter and pray for others. And her mother had the, had the opportunity of witnessing Jane's baptism. When Jane was baptized, she had already been diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer. And these were her words that she shared at the end of her testimony. And I have them up on the screen for you. She entitled her testimony, Hope, Peace and Prayer, a story of redemption. And these are her words. If you haven't invited Jesus into your own life as yet, I can highly recommend the experience. It is my belief that our time here on earth is very short indeed and that Jesus will soon return just as he has promised to claim his believers and destroy Satan and sin forevermore. And what do we say? Amen. She goes on. How I long to see that day. I pray that we will all be ready to go home with him. Amen. That was, that was Jane's testimony. That was Jane's desire that together we would be with Jesus forevermore. At the end of that year, that was at the beginning of the year in February when I baptized Jane. At the end of that year, Jane went to sleep in the arms of Jesus. She went to sleep in the arms of Jesus, awaiting the resurrection. I'm looking forward to the day when I will see Jane. I'm looking forward to the day when I will see her and all those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus. What about you, my friends? Those who are here, those who are watching, are you looking forward to being reunited with all those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus? If that's your desire to be ready when Jesus comes, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me, wherever you may be, and let us thank Jesus and look forward to that precious day. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the blessed hope that we have in Jesus, that one of these days soon he will come in all his glory with all the heavenly angels and he will take with him those that have put their faith and trust in him, those that have passed away and have been resting in his safe and secure arms along with those that are alive and will be caught up together with them to be with the Lord forever. This is our prayer, Father. Keep us close to Jesus. Keep us looking unto him always, the author and finisher of our faith. For this is our prayer in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen and Amen.